Welcome to the Dividend Talk podcast, episode 55, a dive into some lesser discussed European stocks. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Dividend Talk. I'm your co-host European DGI and today I'm joined with the Kleine Kapitalist. EMF is still on holiday on its well-deserved vacation, so uh, I'm really glad uh, to have another guest today. This is a podcast in which we discuss our passion for dividend growth investing with our own unique European flavor. If you are new to our channel, please hit the like button and subscribe to us. And also check out our previous episodes on YouTube and Spotify and all your other favorite platforms. See you on the inside. Hey, the Kleine Capitalist. How great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Great, great for having me. Um, yeah, I'm uh, the Kleine Capitalist. I'm a blogger uh, in Dutch and I post about my purchases um, for over three years now and I'm mainly a dividend growth investor. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, um, you're part of also of the dividend day community and such. So um, uh, we, we know um, we have met each other quite often and such. And I must say, I like your blog a lot. Uh, for the listeners, I will um, put this uh, URL to the blog in the description of the podcast and he mentioned justice in Dutch, but I can tell you just use Google Translate. There's really good stuff in there. And I'm really excited uh, to have you today on the show because for me, you're like an encyclopedia of of, of also European stocks. And um, so I'm really excited. I know we'll, we'll be touching quite some interesting ones. So yeah, really cool to have you here. And um, yeah, but before we start, like, like have you has anything in the, how is it in the news caught your attention this week? Yes, I. Um, one of the things that catched my uh, my eye was uh, Siemens. Um, they mentioned to accelerate their high growth strategy. Um, I think uh, Siemens is one of uh, uh, the better picks in the industrial European space. Uh, so uh, I really support their their new uh, strategy. Uh, so uh, I w it was good to read uh, that one. Yeah, it's really nice that you uh, brought this up because I'm a shareholder in Siemens. Um, I've got some shares there, also um, uh, some of their spin-offs. Uh, I thought it was half years. We also discussed actually Siemens in one of our older podcasts together with EMF. And for me, this is like, um, uh, it has done everything well, but General Electric has failed on effectively. And uh, I'm quite proud that we have such a European uh, industrial company that actually was quite early in the movement of climate change, uh, wind turbines, uh, uh, electric trains and such. Yeah, and that they want to even double down on this growth strategy is actually really nice to see, right? It speaks, for, it speaks about some boldness, I think. Yes, I, uh, I envy your, uh, your, your uh, being a, a shareholder of Siemens, so maybe I will join you. <laughs> Well, welcome to the club once you uh, may, uh, decide to make a decision. <laughs> I, but, um, uh, you know, there was something else great in the news uh, uh, as well. And for instance, the, the Trade Commission in the, in the United States uh, announced today that they are charging Broadcom with illegal monopolization uh, here. It was hitting the news today. And I know you have some shares there. So I was thinking like, and you know a lot about the chip industry as well. So I was really uh, curious about your opinion on this one. Yes. Um, well, Broadcom is one of the more aggressive chip uh, manufacturers to my uh, to my eyes. Uh, and, uh, well, they have an insane dividend growth. It's uh, really uh, working like uh, a magnet on uh, dividend uh, growth investors. Uh, but this is, uh, I feel, something about the risk-reward uh, ratio. Mm -hmm. um what is your perspective on uh, on this happening so the, um you know i had the other day i think even broadcom on one of my watch lists so I, I i dove a little bit into it and then uh one of my twitter followers 
um, shared some articles with me about the aggressive style of management where they typically buy companies uh, use that for also to fuel dividend growth but also kind of kill almost the capex milk it out uh, also having some really really uh, tough contracts with suppliers and such uh, um, where they're really using uh, market manipulation effectively that that and i guess that's also we had a story about monopolization to squeeze them out uh with with, with such so i think uh, business wise ethically speaking um the ceo i think is really operating on the edge but the financial performance has definitely been there so from that point of view if you're a shareholder you could you could yeah i can imagine that many people like this company from a dividend growth point of view ethically it's it's really for me on the boundary i could still own it uh, from that point of view i'm never so scared with monopolization because i see it actually as um, a recognition for a good business model um you know uh, it's not easy also to split up a company it doesn't happen so quickly such companies usually buy a, an army of um, uh, diplomats as well so for me like facebook and these kinds of companies it, it's it's actually really good recognition i think i think it should be almost every ceo's dream to 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 build a monopoly because it means like because you cannot get there with poor products alone yeah once you're there you might start creating poor products that's the risk then yeah that's my thoughts uh, those are my thoughts for Broadcom. Well, I, uh, I really like your your perspective and also uh, about uh, that is uh, like a uh, like uh, a compliment for your business. Um, yeah. But still, I'm I'm uh, happy to diversify. So uh, um, I have more uh, chip uh, semiconductor stocks uh, because I uh, this kind of risks or can happen and uh, can uh, have uh, d detrimental effects upon uh, upon the company yeah i think so. and i think most dividend growth investors have like easily 30 40 stocks so if you have one bad actor in it 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 shouldn't really uh, matter a lot unless uh, the, the allocation is too high yeah i'm i'm uh, i'm not worried no but but maybe there's also another interesting topic that you uh, brought up before the show about the news and and you mentioned uh, an article a, a Dutch article about whether data as a source of truth is a myth right yes yes this is really one of my my uh, yeah, the things that which I really uh, am keen on um, when you know how da data is produced and uh, I'm quite familiar with it. Uh, then you know it's just um, a model of the reality, and those um, those are cached also in the yearly reports, etc. And what I typically see in the community is that everyone is crunching the numbers and uh, extrapolating and looking uh, at all historical performances and uh, well make a suggestion about the future. Uh, but I feel there's less attention for the fundamentals, the, the, the real drivers of uh, the business, of how the company really works. Uh, so um, I'm very aware about uh, that data can bring uh, a lot of value, but uh, could also be uh, harm you. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, we we exchanged some thoughts earlier about that, right? At this, and and this also, I think. If you're also new to investing, it I think if you start reading books, uh, uh, it's easy to fall in this trap of looking at some of the the, the performance, like five-year growth rates and these kinds of things. Exactly. But it's really about like for me always like what's the catalyst for a company? Yeah, where is their growth going to come from from the next five years? Um, I, when, when it's possible for me, I always try to test their products. Right. So. Like like for Google, we can test their product. We can test YouTube. We can see the so it's a really easy one. There are some companies that are harder to test, but sometimes you just need to go to to YouTube or to to other other uh, pages to Amazon to just read product reviews and to see how they are complaining or how they are cheering these uh, products, right? So it's and and this is this is nothing to do with data crunching. Yeah, it's all about getting a feeling for 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 their company for their products. Uh, how people perceive it yeah yeah good one i think um 
uh, we could do a little bit less of this data crunching in the community. But it's so easy and so nice to play with data. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it'll, it'll give you a feeling of confidence. Uh. Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, uh, thanks for bringing those uh, um, uh, news items, very interesting. But uh, let's go to the main topic of today. So today we will talk a little bit about lesser known European stocks and we will be categorizing them to a few secular growth trends, which we see. Um, maybe a good disclaimer before that. Um, these are not necessarily dividend growth companies. These are uh, by definition more European stocks. Some of them pay a dividend. Uh, some not so these are not like recommendations for necessarily for dividend investors but we they, these might be companies maybe interesting once they start paying a dividend and such but they have some secular growth trends that we really want to call out today so um the clinic capitalist the first one uh where we have a secular growth trend is what we call the digitalization of literally everything right as companies digital transformation um i mean digital is everywhere so what is the first company that you uh, thought about uh, uh, regarding this trend? Yeah, the first company that came to mind was uh, Soytech. I hope I pronounce it uh, correctly. It's a French company. And um, it's also because uh, the general opinion is that in Europe there are not many technology stocks. Well, I think this is a, a hidden gem. Uh, they produce uh, silicon on insulator wafers, uh, substrates. Um, so are they part in the semiconductor chain? And um, well, in pretty much every smartphone, there's one silicon part of, of Soytec. Um, this company is really uh, benefiting from the uh, 5G trend. And uh, well, the revenues will uh, most, uh, is, anticipated to grow to triple in five years um, and what is also nice to know it's uh, they uh, buy their wafers from Siltronic which is a German company so and the Euro European tech companies are helping each other so it so it tech is also without debt and it looks pricey but when you look at the growth then uh, actually it it, uh, it might not be uh, that expensive, and it wouldn't surprise me if they uh, will start to uh, to start with paying a dividend soon. Yeah, yeah. I was so I I didn't hear ever of this company before, and then you pointed me out as also a member of the forty uh, CAC uh, CAC of, uh, of 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 the French index. And uh, yeah, from what I've seen, it looks really, really solid. And specifically, also since last year, you can see really the growth also in the in the share price here. So yeah, I can see. It. I mean, I don't know how reliable the uh, statistics are, but Yahoo Finance gives the uh, price to earnings of eighty six. <laughs> yeah, so there's not a typical twenty uh, price to earnings that dividend growth investors look 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 for. But you know, at the same time, the the share price also more than double just in a single year, right? And and the growth just seems to be there. So, um, market cap, I think, of six billion now, approximately. Yes, okay. uh, the real mode is in that they uh, produce uh, wafers with less power consumption. So I feel, mm -hmm. and this is the the the, the most sought after. Uh, yeah characteristics so uh, i i think uh the growth rate is underestimated so um yeah. uh well it's uh for growth investors it's probably a nice one to to look into yeah super okay now thank you um that was the first interesting one totally out of my uh, circle of competence totally uh, out of my comfort zone as a dividend growth investor so but hey, uh, that's what I expected. Uh, lots of uh, these golden nuggets. Um, I also know that as part of the, um, how you said, the, the digitalization, you also came up with a teleperformance, which was a really interesting one in this context. Yes, this one uh, originated in one of the bigger problems that I see with, with large service companies. It's, it's about uh, customer service. You know, everyone is complaining about bad service and this uh, co company uh, offers uh, solutions um, for uh, interacting with your customers um, in a, 
uh, also with call centers, digitization, uh, analytics, uh, etc. Uh, and they're really expanding. So I think it's uh, it's a nice one to mention. Yeah, but th this is also not a small company, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, from that point of view. Um, uh. No, no. Um, so. Uh, it's it's really surprising that uh, well from our community we don't look at this kind of companies while they mm -hmm. are uh, playing uh, yeah, such a such an essential role for some uh, some of the bigger companies in the world. Yeah, yeah. So what I noticed they have like a twenty billion market cap at the moment, uh, price to earnings ratio of uh, slightly above sixty. Um, but also a dividend. They pay a dividend yield of uh, zero point seven uh, percent. So hey, that's the first one. Uh, so that's a good one. <laughs> but again, share price almost doubled over a year. Um, I, I think it is really of, in this trend now with many tech stocks and such that we're really, really uh, benefiting from the pandemic. But even if you look at the five years price chart as such, you see like it's just a stable growth. It's not really volatile. This stock. So it, it seems to hit all the numbers uh, here, but it also has almost four hundred thousand employees, which I was totally not aware of. No, yeah, that's mainly because of the call centers, of course. But uh, it's uh, it's uh, unbelievable that such a big company in, in number of uh, yeah exactly employees uh, you you never heard about in. Yeah, exactly. Four hundred thousand. I mean, that's that's a large city in uh, in Europe. I mean, not a not a capital, but it's a decent city. Yeah. Okay. So, and and then the third one. What's the first stock in the in the digital uh, of everything uh, trend? Yeah, the third one that uh, I picked is called Avast Software. It's uh, active in cybersecurity software and uh, origin it in uh, the Czech Republic. Um, well, of course, this is uh, one of the bigger trends. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, it's really a, a nice one uh, when you uh, want to have exposure in the uh, cybersecurity uh, sector. Yeah. Yeah, I know Avast, of course, because I always got these pop-ups on my screen to install it when I bought a new laptop. It was uh, typically packaged with a new uh, new laptop at the time and such. I used it a lot, and um, um, I believe they also uh, um, acquired AVG Technologies at the time, also yeah. a product that I used. So I was really surprised when you uh, I said came up with this uh, stock. And also, this one pays quite a good dividend. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's above two percent, right? Yeah, it's uh, almost two point four percent. I checked the dividend policy. They have uh, the typical dividend policy in Europe of paying around forty percent of their, in this case, of their levered uh, free cash flow. Um, so as long as the company keeps growing, their dividends will probably um, also grow. But what I what I just like about this is that. This is like an antivirus uh, uh, cybersecurity uh, software where we are usually known with, with the American um, uh, big tech companies, right? So to see this as a European company, uh, a Czech multinational company, right, listed in the UK, is uh, it's really cool uh, that it's on the list. And even a proper dividend of of 2.4 percent almost although the pe is still really juicy with uh, uh more than 40. yeah nice one so what i will do by the way uh, for the listeners i will put all the tickers and the isin codes later also in the description uh, of this podcast uh, because we might not pronounce all the names well or it might go a little bit quick so i'll put all the data in there so that you can later just go to the description and uh, uh, pick them up Okay, so here we have three nice companies from um, uh, digitalization trend. I think this is a secular growth trend that will still keep us uh, earning money for the next 10 years uh, from that point of view. Um, the next trend that we have chosen is more like the aging population. And, you know, specifically in Europe, I think um, we're not making so many kids anymore as our ancestors were, were doing. So naturally, the population growth is a little bit... Uh, stagnating but people are also getting older at the at the moment right so i think this is also again if you look at the the demographies in the big countries now many people are retiring at this at, at this time around i think 
well, I heard yesterday somewhere 50 percent of the population I don't know probably Netherlands is more than 50 years old so I think there's a really strong growth trend and I'm curious to, to hear which kind of companies um, uh, you're considering here yeah the first company that I uh, considered was GN store Nord it's uh, a Danish company and they are active in hearing systems and of course when uh, people are aging you, you see many peoples with those earring systems and you know uh, they used to be very big but now they uh, are innovated right to well, almost you cannot see them anymore mm -hmm. and this is one of the, the, the larger companies uh, uh, producing hearing systems um, and the thing is that they were hit by the COVID uh, mm. pandemic so they sold a, uh, less hearing systems but uh, they also have a business in audio systems and the home working um, uh, well exploded so they they uh, last year they had an organic growth of uh, above 80 percent which wow. uh, yes that's insane well the hearing systems remain stable um, so they're uh, well um, in total, they had an organic growth above uh, forty percent, which is uh, great, um, and they pay a dividend. Yeah. Uh, well, the dividend is really small in this re that regard. <laughs> just, uh, I think zero point two six percent. So uh, it's a bit on the low end. I think it will take uh, fifty years probably to get to a ten percent yield on cost, uh, um, unless they double it every year or so. Which might be possible, of course. It all depends on the growth and the future uh, prospects. But uh, yeah, I mean, these are the golden nuggets that we have in Europe, right? These kinds of companies, like, like, it's really like, um, and and this, by the way, huge company, yeah. But still, like the, these these like equipments, and I think in Europe we anyway have a really good pharma uh, industry, and and this is also a bit fitting in there. But what is also nice, what you mentioned, is like. They are good in hearing aids, so for, for this, for this, for, for the aging population. But at the same time, they use this technology also for headsets and such, right? Uh, uh, here, so it's it's a nice way of being core to your technology, but then diversify in the in the, in the consumer segments. Yeah, and you really see it's working out uh, because they they level out those, uh, those, those yeah. things with hearing and audio, yeah. and uh, so they are quite resilient during the, this uh, pandemic. Yeah. And what what are your expectations that they um, uh, continue on a high growth path, or or do you feel like a price earnings of forty five is a little bit on the uh, high end for this company? Yes, it's uh, on the high end for sure, uh, but it could be typically so company which is always expensive and uh, just keep yeah. uh, keep on running. Yeah. Uh, they have a natural tailwind with the aging population and uh, but also with uh, digitization home working. Yeah. So they have some good prospects, but it's richly valued. And then the next one is a really nice one because it's a Noble 30 member, Coloplast. And then, yeah. Yeah, it's also a Danish company. Uh, and it's uh, in one of my favorite segments, uh, medical devices. Uh, I really uh, am uh, bullish on uh, MedTech. Uh, mm -hmm. for, the, for the next 10 years, I will think that it will do, uh, do great. I have uh, a couple uh, of other stocks, not Coloplast uh, yet. Mm -hmm. Well, also... Uh, doing it very, very, very well. Um, it pays a dividend. Um, I think it's um, 1.7 percent, and uh, also uh, have a nice dividend growth path. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a Noble 30 member, right? So uh, it has a minimum 22 years of uh, dividend growth. I, I would need to look up the exact number, but I studied this company several times. And I'm amazed about the performance of this company, how it really uh, turned from a really small company into a powerhouse um, at the moment. And it just doesn't seem to really stop. I mean, it's not anymore the high growth as it had in the past. So personally, I find the price to earnings of over 50, I find it way overvalued compared to how I see it in its future growth. Um, so that's why the dividend yield is also on the low end, of course, with 1.7%. But this is such a company that um, always feels expensive. Though I must say, 
um, we're also in a really unique situation with low interest, right? So then these companies, I think, are also sometimes justified a little bit higher. But I, I'm not touching Color Plus at the moment. For me, it should almost half before I get really interested. Um, but maybe that's also my Dutch nature of being cheap. So, yeah. Well, I'm also Dutch, and uh, I want to say I'm also cheap, <laughs> 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 but I can can do it with all those companies with with PPEs <laughs> above fifty, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes we need to cheat on ourselves, right? <laughs> okay. And then uh, there was also a third company, which is maybe not a, uh, a lesser known to Europeans from their products and their brands, but many people, international people like from the States, don't know this company really. And it's Essilor Luxotica. Essilor Luxotica, yeah, it's an uh, Italian French. Uh corporation and um it's headed in in uh, paris i think they are famous from their uh, ray-ban glasses and what you typically see at the aging population is that they uh, need more glasses right uh, and uh, i do not have uh, glasses myself but once i was in a store i was um, i was well uh, surprised how expensive those are uh so that that's really uh that's what triggered me so to look into uh, this company um and they also uh on the expansion strategy right so that mm -hmm. was in the news uh, this week with uh, the acquisition of grand vision yeah um so maybe we can briefly touch up on uh, that uh, news uh, yeah so you know um you know this company right is also owned by one of the richest persons um uh, in europe and I, they made the acquisition of Grand Vision, and Grand Vision is a, is a part of, I think it's called Hull Investments. And they actually ended up in court because of the pandemic, as I understood it. Uh, Grand Vision, of course, was severely impacted um, uh, in the beginning. So what happened, I think, that uh, Essilor Luxotica wanted to have a lower price for this company because the value changed or the underlying value. They went. They went uh, um, uh, to court, and I believe I, I believe they, they even had had uh, something of a case. But in the end, they decided still to pay uh, the full amount of what they uh, committed to to Grand Vision. Uh, in the end, because I also think they just noticed like how big of a brand this is, also in the Netherlands. So yeah, it 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 is expanding again via growth, and uh, it will get now the whole um, uh, Grand Vision part under this company, and I think it completes kind of um, the mission of the founder of uh, Essilor Luxotica, uh, as how he was envisioning this to be an empire. I think he has it now with this acquisition. So, also here, dividend yield one point four percent. A PE ratio is is, is 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 not realistic because we know that the earnings part was really bad in the pandemic, um, but I still find it overvalued compared to the uh, fundamentals. I agree on that. It's uh, it's richly valued. Yeah. Okay, and then um, maybe a little bridge to this because um, we have a third trend, but. You know, we'll just have one stock there, and it's a little bit uh, cheating on it. But of course, we were talking just about uh, a luxury brand and, and and glasses. So there's also, of course, this Instagram generation, right? That all wants to look beautiful, and we know that uh, L'Oreal benefits a lot from that. But you brought up also a really nice story about Norwegian staple, actually, and you really surprised me about that in a, in a very interesting way. Can you, can you say a little bit more about this one? Yeah, the company uh, is called Orkla. Um, and I choose that one because typically we always see the same consumer staples like Unilever and Nestle, Racket Bank, uh, etc. So I thought, well, this is also quite a big company. Uh, and uh, maybe you can know them from uh, the toothpaste uh, brand Jordan. Um, but what I really like about this company is they're um, also in more the care products. Um, so more like the L'Oreal uh, touch and uh, also a quite a good exposure to India. 
uh, I always look at uh, the geographic footprint from the revenues and really like uh, large exposures to emerging markets. Uh, for the last 10 years, they have a, a total return of about uh, 9%. It's really going steadily. So it's it's a good uh, uh, pick for uh, for your portfolio and it's yielding um, above 3%. Yeah, I noticed it, and um, um, actually, from what I heard you saying, I really, really like it. And I think many people that follow me know that I'm a big uh, fan of consumer staples. So I really think I have one to look a little bit uh, uh, deeper into. And if you look at uh, the five-year performance, uh, it feels a little bit like it was dead money. Yeah, if if you would have bought it five years ago towards now. You know, it allows nicely the dividends to accumulate and to grow into it. So I don't find it uh, richly valued. It is trading slightly above 19 of a price to earnings. So it's, uh, this one really attracts me. So thank you, uh, the clinic uh, capitalists, for uh, bringing this one up. Yes, I also want to mention another reason because it's uh, Norwegian. And I really like the exposure to the Norwegian kroner. I think mm -hmm. it's a strong uh, strong currency. Currency, exactly. Uh, and also, uh, well, less affected by what we see with uh, quantitative easing. So I think uh, you can also uh, have some good return uh, from uh, currency effects. Yeah, yeah, really good one. OK, cool. So you know, you gave me seven European stocks. Some of them I have never looked into, so thank you for that. I know why I have not looked into them ever, probably because they didn't pop up on my screener. Um, but from the other end, um, Oracle and, and, and some of the others, I will definitely do some more homework there. Um, I like, for instance, uh, what you mentioned about also GN Store Nord. Uh, I, I believe also, I think you mentioned that before the show of, uh, of the Jabra equipment, and everyone likes Jabra. So there are really some good products in here that you shared with me today. So thanks for that. I'll look into it. Avast and uh, Oracle will be the first two one uh, uh, for me. Hey, but um, also um, let's go. Uh, let's close with with that out this section, the main topic of today, these seven stocks. But let's go to listeners' questions. We have few again. I also know one specifically for you. So let's look into that. But the first one comes from, like always, from Phil Phil Sackler, and he asks. Would you buy shares of a football club? Example, Manchester United, Juventus, Borussia Dortmund, Ajax. Would you? What do you think about it? No. Just a short answer. Uh, but uh, I advised it once to a friend who was uh, losing mon money on online betting. So I mentioned you could better buy a share of, of uh, the football clubs that you uh, bet your money on. So, yeah. um, but no, not for me. It's too uh, too unpredictable, more emotion and like more fashion. So no, not yeah. for me. I have to say, I would never probably buy uh, shares of a football club for exact same reasons. Thanks for asking, Phil. Uh, but no, no football clubs for us. Uh. <laughs> and the next question is from uh, Jilly. And he asks us, how do you guys create a watch list? What sources do you use? Yes, a, a really nice question. Um, it made me uh, puzzling my mind. And the, the biggest origin is the real world. Uh, just by walking, for example, uh, I went to the office uh, again. I walked to uh, a gate from the, the railway, and I saw that name Thales uh, on it, uh, and that made me curious about the company. And it happens to be uh, a French company, active on radar systems, defense, <laughs> etc. It's a totally different company, and that that's uh, then I will uh, I'll put it on my watch list and look uh, if it uh, could be. Uh, a good pick for my portfolio so yeah. th that is a big source for me yeah yeah and uh, for me um i mean I, I i use the dividend screener i have an article for that uh on my blog as well i might uh, put the link in the description so i usually screen i use what you say as well by by keeping my eyes open into the environment but in poland it is a little bit harder sometimes because the most most stocks i get only inspired by by going to the supermarket um because that's where you usually see the international products um 
but also just from listening to the community. I mean, today we um, discussed seven stocks. There are two stocks that I will probably look into. So I get a lot of input from the community as well. And just on Twitter, keeping my eyes open to what people are saying. Um, so and that's how I usually then create my watch list. And I, I don't know if you have the same, but over time, if you look into a lot of stocks, then at a certain point, you, you know, like 100 tickers approximately, probably with a price estimate or, or a price around it, you know, kind of where, what the yield was. So then if you see then uh, somewhere uh, in the news that the price was going down, that might also grab your attention again to quickly look into things. Yeah, yeah same, for, same for me. Um, I also uh, looking to patterns. So mm -hmm. uh, also by community, reading news, uh, companies show up more and more often. And that is the time when I will look to read the most negative analyst report that I can access. Um, but it's because it triggers you, right? Yeah, yeah. Just to hear a different way of thinking and seeing. Uh, I do that also sometimes. Then checking, like, what is the bear bear case, and do I agree with it or not, right? Um, and based on that, uh, it makes it easier uh, to add a stock to the watch list. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jilly. Nice question. Then the next one is from uh, Fire Pete, uh, and he is. Is this question to me? He said, "In your spring cleanup, you sold Total, but you still have Shell. Is there any specific reason why you prefer Shell over Total?" Well, to to clarify that, I didn't own Total. There on my blog, there are two things. I have got a desired portfolio, um, and I've got my real portfolio. What I did there is that I don't want Total anymore in my desired portfolio, but I will keep Shell in there. Why do I keep Shell in there? Just because I own a massive amount of Shell and I didn't uh, own anything from Total yet. I actually see these companies as a little bit interchangeable. They are both uh, pushed or via the strategy and the shareholders or via the, the government into more uh, green, I said, investments. So I, I both fully agree with their um, strategy. I, I just didn't. I just wanted to lower my general exposure to energy and oil stocks. So I started to just uh, limit, let's say, from five oil, oil stocks to three. And that's why Total didn't make the cut. Nothing specifically. If I would look at them both today, I would probably still go for Shell because I would take, um, how is it? I would take into the consideration that they have less pressure from the cash flow on the dividends now. While I still think that uh, although they cut the dividend shell last year, I still think that this is a dividend company uh, uh, by design. So I would probably still go for shell. Okay, so then this question is from Richard, and this one is for you to answer uh, the clinic up the list. And he's asking, what is what is your biggest conviction purchase recently, and why? Well, the first talk that came to my mind is uh, Fonovia. Um, it's a German real estate uh, company, and I picked that one because I think it's an uh, well, it's it's a good hedge against inflation. Um, the stock price went down because the fear of uh, raising the interest rates, and uh, they also uh, acquired Deutsche Wohnen. What I really like about the company is that they uh, uh, offer affordable living spaces. Um, which is uh, well uh, another mar market than in the Netherlands, for example. Um, it also pays a nice dividend, and they have a, a, a really nice double-digit di uh, growth. Uh, they have a nice expansion uh, strategy, which uh, have historically worked out very well for them. Um, so yeah, I uh, I really think this is uh, this is a great pick, and uh, I've wrote an uh, uh, extensive uh, art uh, post about this company on my blog. So if you want to know more, I uh, would. Uh, uh, I'll add the link to the description, and then um, I will recommend everyone to use Google Translate. It works pretty well from Dutch to English. So, yeah, nice one. Thanks. And that was also straight away, by the way, the stock pick for this week. So <laughs> thank you for that as well. And thank you for triggering this question already, uh, uh, Richard. OK, um, next question is from uh, Dividend Dane. And first of all, he 
he compliments us for being Dutch and not having a single cannabis stock in our portfolio. So the question actually is, do you really have no association to cannabis uh, there? But uh, you, you don't need to answer that. But anyway, what is real question is like, what is the one stock that got away from both of us? So a stock that we should have bought earlier, but never got on board. And now it's just too expensive. Well, for me, uh, one of the uh, stocks that I really missed is L'Oreal. Uh, I really hate it to see uh, it keeps on running, running, running. Well, uh, I love the products. I love uh, the, well, the secular trends which are behind mm -hmm. them. And uh, now it's so expensive. Uh, yeah. So uh, that, that is the one that I uh, really missed. Yeah. Now, for me, it's uh, Walmart. Um, I remember there was a time that uh, several years ago, three or four years ago, Walmart was trading around 4% dividend yield. And at that time, um, I don't know, there was a sentiment like Walmart would almost be dead. Yeah. And I should have bought them. I think it was like $60 or something like that at the time. I, I don't remember where it stands now. I only know that when the sentiment flew away from the from the market, it started just growing, growing, and it never looked back. So, and they might even have done a stock split in between. So I really regret that one because it was, it was so open and, and out there. They're like, buy, buy, buy me, buy me, buy me, telling me. But I was still too early in my journey, uh, I think, to to spot such opportunities uh, uh, at that time. I was more sensitive to the sentiment than looking at the fundamentals at the time. Thanks, David and Dane. Uh, good question. And uh, yes, I don't own anything around cannabis indeed. Um, I don't own tobacco stocks also anymore. So also no association to cannabis there. Um, and I never smoke cannabis either. So maybe that is uh, uh, the reason why as well. I don't oh. either. <laughs> nah, <laughs> exactly. We are so not Dutch, I guess. Uh, Anyway, the last question is from Danny from Poland. And um, he's asking me a little bit more about uh, Dino SA. It's a gross grocery store in Poland, and it's rapidly um, uh, increasing its uh, presence in Poland. Um, he, he mentions that it doesn't pay a dividend yet, but he's asking me uh, for my opinion here. So, um, well, Danny, I looked into it. I must confess that I've never seen the shop, actually. Uh, the reason for that is when I looked up uh, at their investor relations website is that it's mainly present in the uh, west side of Poland. So I think there's less than two stores on 100,000 people in the in the region where I live. So uh, I've checked them. I saw that one is uh, like on 10 kilometers from me, so not in my reach. But uh, the, their, their, their store growth is really, really, really impressive. I think they are growing by 10 to 20 percent in store count. So this is really like high growth. Also, if you look at um, um, how it is performing as a stock as well, it went uh, from 2019 from 100, uh, I guess, uh, Zloty, I guess, to, to, to 300. So it's a threefold in, in, in just two and a half to three years. It's really impressive. And from what I've seen, it's all justified. I think uh, you might be onto a really good stock here if you believe in growth investment. And to your point also, um, Danny, these are consumer staples like Ahold and such uh, that at a certain moment when they mature will definitely start paying dividends because that's what their cash flow will allow them to do. But now it's really in growth mode, so it's not for me. But it's really uh, it's a really interesting stock. So uh, thanks for sharing that with us in the community. Good. Now, the Kleine Capitalist, we're coming here to the uh, end of the show. Um, uh, it was really good having you on in here. We have discussed literally like seven or eight stocks today. We have never discussed on this show. So thank you so much for that. Yeah, it's my pleasure. It was really great uh, to uh, well, to discuss those uh, those talks. Um, well, uh, I must say uh, I, I was... Uh, curious about your reaction because they were really low yield uh, high growth types of uh, stocks and uh, we had a, a discussion uh, before but i hope uh, that you can uh, also see that there are a lot of uh, european uh, stocks that are uh, well of great quality in the low uh, yield space 
Yeah, and, uh, I'm really happy that you brought this to the attention because if you look at the blue chip companies in, in Europe, they all feel like a little bit uh, being outcompeted by, by the American equivalents often, right? So, and here you really gave some golden nuggets of some niche industries where, they're, where these are really like A players and, and top companies. So, yeah, really good job. And um, yeah, I find in general uh, uh, all very expensive from a multiple point of view. But I also see this in the context of where we are with the current stock market, uh, low interest environment, the economy. Um, but yeah, definitely two ideas out of this. And the others, I, I might might look a little bit more into it just to, to understand better uh, the dynamics there. And maybe also that whether those are by the dip companies. Good. Hey, thanks for having you here. Thanks for everyone listening. Um, let us know um, also what you thought about these stock recommend uh, stock 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 mentions. Let's say because to be clear, these are not necessarily recommendations as such. Always do your own homework, of course. Um, but everyone, have a good weekend. You too, the clinic capitalist, and uh, see you all next week again.